I am Brother Cornell West. This is Chris Hedges. I'm Rosa Clemente. Hey, what's up? This is Chuck D, Public Enemy Prophets of Rage. And this is News Beat. Hey, everyone. This is Manny Faces, producer and host of News Beat. Welcome to another episode. Now, as journalists, this episode centers on an issue that's very close to our hearts and critically important to the very DNA of democracy itself. We're talking about press freedoms and the right to report the truths in the public good without the fear of government prosecution. Now, as you might know, if you've been on Twitter at all in the past few years, this is something that's under near daily attack from the highest echelons of power in this country. Now, President Donald Trump isn't the first to assail or jail whistleblowers for leaking critically important information to the press. He's merely the latest. Democratic President Barack Obama was actually the worst to date prosecuting more leakers during his administration than all others combined. The weapon of choice? The Espionage Act, a World War I era statute intended to prosecute spies for doing such things as, say, sharing battlefield plans with an enemy during wartime. Yet more and more, it's being wielded against not only leakers, but now with the charging of WikiLeaks publisher Julian Assange, those who are publishing and receiving such revelations. In other words, the U.S. government is criminalizing news gathering and dissemination. And if successful against Assange, it would set a brutal precedent for all journalists and media outlets, with catastrophic ramifications for press freedoms in this country. Every news agency in the world should be sounding the alarm about this case. Yet there's mostly silence, but not here. Blowing the whistle on all of this for us is Peter Stern, managing editor of the U.S. Press Freedom Tracker, James Goodale, a leading communications and First Amendment attorney and former vice president, general counsel, and vice chairman of the New York Times, best known for leading the Times in its successful litigation in the famous Pentagon Papers case, and Carrie DeSalle, a staff attorney at the Knight First Amendment Institute at Columbia University and lecturer in law at Columbia Law School. As you know, on this podcast, we do things with a little bit of flavor. Our lyrical hip-hop assassin contributing lyrics of fury to this episode, end of the week world champion, Osiris Anthem. Now, after the episode, please be sure to swing by our brand new website at usnewsbeat.com to learn more about the voices in this episode, who we are, and what we do. And do us a favor, rate and review us on Apple Podcasts or wherever you subscribe to us. And for now, this is Espionage Act and the battle for the free press. The Espionage Act was passed in 1917 in the context of the First World War, when the United States was very concerned about the potential of sabotage by German spies. And so the idea of the Espionage Act was to pass a law that would basically criminalize the dissemination of sensitive national security information. So if you went and stole battle plans or if you stole material from a military base and then gave that to essentially the Germans or the enemy, that would be criminalized by the Espionage Act. So that was the original intention of the act, basically to criminalize espionage in a time of war. But the act was written very broadly and almost immediately it was used to go after domestic critics of the war. So people who were encouraging opposition to the draft, that was considered to be a violation of the Espionage Act because it was harming American national security. It was making it tougher for the United States to execute the war. There was a debate in Congress around whether the president should have the power to censor the press during a time of war. Some senators believed the president should have the power to demand censorship during a time of war, citing the example of during the Civil War when supposedly journalists would publish troop movements. Other senators believed that this would be a violation of the First Amendment and that the Espionage Act should not include a censorship provision. And in the end, a censorship provision was not included in the Espionage Act, despite the intentions of President Wilson. He wanted the power to order the press not to print certain information. So originally, the Espionage Act did not include 
any anti-press provisions. It was solely targeted at the criminalization of espionage, and particularly the criminalization of disseminating and sharing sensitive national security information. But it did not allow the president to order newspapers not to print certain information. Decades later, the Espionage Act would be marshaled in a way that was anti-press. So, in 1918, the year after the Espionage Act was enacted, a package of amendments was passed, which is collectively known as the Sedition Act, which outlawed, quote, disloyal, profane, scurrilous, or abusive language that aimed to incite, provoke, or encourage resistance to the United States or promote the cause of its enemies. It was kind of an expansion of the Espionage Act, where the Espionage Act had specifically targeted behavior of enemies of the United States, essentially going after saboteurs or spies who tried to steal information that could harm national defense. The Sedition Act went after basically domestic critics of the war who, by opposing the war, and especially by opposing the draft, were seen as helping the enemy. That was immediately used to go after a lot of domestic critics of the war, especially socialist activists. Most famously, of course, Eugene Debs, who was a presidential candidate for the Socialist Party, was imprisoned on the basis of the Sedition Act. That conviction, along with the conviction of other anti-war newspaper publishers like Charles Schenck and Jacob Froerwerk, were actually upheld by the Supreme Court in 1919. There were unanimous opinions in which Justice Oliver Holmes wrote that going after domestic critics of the war did not violate the First Amendment because by opposing the draft and encouraging people not to cooperate with it, they were harming American national security, so they were not protected by the First Amendment. The concern, at least at the time the Espionage Act was being drafted, was really over whether the president should be able to exercise a kind of prior restraint and prevent newspapers from publishing information. There wasn't really consideration about what if a newspaper published something and then prosecutors tried to bring charges against them. I think that really the Nixon administration was the first one to really see the Espionage Act as a tool to go after the press for leaking information that was, I guess, related to national security, but not you know, troop movements during a time of war. Obviously, one of the reasons that the Supreme Court ended up ruling that the Times and the Washington Post could publish the Pentagon Papers was because it was a history of the Vietnam War. It was not directly relevant to ongoing military operations. Uh, I was just wondering, you know, uh, what in the world is it? do responsible publishers think about to put out tr trunk loads of secret documents it's getting, it's getting waste every day that's awful isn't it it's getting uh, awful i mean and i mean no responsibility it, and it's uh the, i mean as i said it's no skin off from a political standpoint part it's no skin well, off no, of I, our I, back I, as as, I think as far as this, yeah. this latest thing that's happened yeah. in your favor but, but we get no comfort out of that it will destroy the presidency it can hurt somebody the next guy coming along yeah, that's what they're trying to do too that's exactly what they're trying to do yeah. no no well, no, it's a bad uh, thing. We'll, we'll fight it all the way. And I'm telling you, I've told Mitchell, by God, we're going to find the... We think we know the guy that did this. He's a fellow that worked over at Ellsberg, who worked in the Defense Department. And by golly, we're going to get him, and he's going to go to jail. That's the only thing to do with it. That's right. He's got to go to jail for this. That's the only thing to do. That's right. Big Brother's watching me, opening my diary. Big Brother's watching me, and I can feel his eyes on me. Big brother's watching me, knocking me and locking me. He told you yeah. I'm a spy, yeah. just so yeah. he could spy on me. 
History's mobile. Yeah. The world that we live in is global. Protecting the country's important. The Espionage Act that was noble uh, at first. Right. Cause see if what? somebody was selling us secrets about all our levels of defense, we could lose all of our culture and freedom. But of course, you see, kid, nobility died in the season. Power never comes to reason. The truth that get treated like treason. If you and the government is disagreeing, the prison sellers will you be sleeping. They gon' find a way to have you bleeding, have you leaking, cause of all that leaking. This is a problem, America telling the truth doesn't make me a heretic. I love my freedom and speech and I cherish it. Faulty democracies blemishes, left us with damage, our children inherited. They gotta know about all your oppression and illegal warmongering and expenditures. This is what the spirit of the First Amendment is. The energy, the faith, the devotion which we bring to this endeavor will light our country and all who serve it. And the glow from that fire can truly light the world. Kennedy's idealistic pledge pulls U.S. forces into a distant corner of Southeast Asia, Vietnam. We're on the outskirts of the village of Cam Ni with elements of the 1st Battalion, 9th Marines. And we were walking into this village when you can hear what happened. Khan, let's move in with those other guys. It first appeared that the Marines had been sniped at and that a few houses were made to pay. Shortly after, an officer told me he had orders to go in and level the string of hamlets that surrounds Kamni village. 50 years ago today, on March 16, 1968, U.S. soldiers attacked the Vietnamese village of My Lai. U.S. troops arrived at 7.30 a.m. local time. Even though the soldiers met no resistance, they slaughtered more than 500 Vietnamese women, children, and old men over the next four hours in what became known as the My Lai Massacre. The Pentagon Papers case is about this. First, it's about Pentagon Papers. And those papers constituted a history of the Vietnam War that Daniel Ellsberg leaked to the New York Times. They were classified top secret. The Times published uh, versions of it or excerpts of it for a couple of days, and then the government came in and stopped publication with an injunction. Okay. Nothing else of interest in the world? Yes, today? sir. Very significant, this uh, goddamn New York Times expose of the most highly classified documents of the war. Oh, that. I see. That, that, I didn't read the story, but uh, you mean that, that was leaked out of the Pentagon? Sir, it, uh, the whole study that was done for McNamara and then carried on after McNamara left by Clifford and the peaceniks over there. This is a devastating uh, security breach of, of the greatest magnitude of anything I've well, ever seen. Well, what, uh, what's being done about it then? I mean, I didn't... Uh, I did we know this was coming out? No, we did not, sir. Uh, the New York Times then got into a litigation with the United States government that lasted for X days and ended up in the Supreme Court. In the meantime, Ellsberg, once the New York Times was stopped from publishing, delivered the Pentagon Papers to the Washington Post. It published for a while. It, too, was stopped. It joined the New York Times at the Supreme Court. The United States would wage its unofficial war for nearly a decade. In 1971, former military analyst Daniel Ellsberg released the Pentagon Papers. I'd been in the Pentagon when we started the bombing campaign. I knew we were in the course of dropping many times the tonnage of World War II on Vietnam. I came back from Vietnam understanding that there was going to be no kind of success and nothing but a bloody stalemate in Vietnam and felt that we should get out. The concealment of this information for 25 years has now led to the death of 50,000 Americans and several hundred thousand Vietnamese in the last few years, a couple of million over 20 years of this involvement. And I think that uh, the odds have been weighted in favor of secrecy. The United States Supreme Court decided that the First Amendment protected publication and that the two newspapers and any other newspaper could not be stopped from publication. And so the New York Times 
and other papers, including the Washington Post, published a story based on the Pentagon Papers, which Ellsberg had given them. What is your advice on that uh, time thing, John? Uh, you, would, you would like to do it? Uh, I would believe so, Mr. President. Otherwise, we will look a little foolish in not mm-hmm. following through on our legal obligations. And uh, Has this ever been done before? Uh, publication like this? or No, no, no. Have you, have, have, has the government ever done this to a paper before? Oh, yes. Advising of their... Oh. Yes, we've done this before. Have we? All right. Yes, sir. Uh, I would think that... How, how do you go about it? You do it sort of low-key? Low-key. You call them and then uh, send a telegram to confirm it. Mm-hmm. Look, as far as the Times is concerned, hell, they're our enemies. I think we just ought to do it. And anyway, uh, Henry, tell them what you just heard from Rostow. Well, Rostow called on behalf of Johnson, and he said that it is Johnson's strong view that this is an attack on the whole integrity of government, that if you, that if whole, ca- whole file cabinets can be stolen and then made available to the press, uh, you can't have order the government anymore. Well, and I- he said if the president defends the integrity, any action we take, he will back publicly. And what was my role? I starred in this role as general counsel and vice president of of the New York Times because I was the one who decided effectively that they should be published in as much as the outside lawyers whom the New York Times consulted uh, disagreed with me, the Times agreed with me, and the papers were published accordingly, and I ran the legal team that took the case from New York City to Washington, D.C., and the Supreme Court. Well, the government came up with a cockamamie claim that the Espionage Act covered the publication of the Pentagon Papers case. I say it's cockamamie because no one had ever thought the Espionage Act passed in 1918, and we're now talking about 1971, applied to publications. So this was from left right field, actually. I say left field, but Mitchell's the right field, right? Uh, And we thought he was uh, totally nuts. All right, sir. But absolutely. But uh, he just, he just, I just don't, I just say that we've got to keep our eye on the main ball. The main ball's Ellsberg. We got to get this son of a bitch. And, uh, and, you know, I was talking to somebody over here yesterday, I mean, one of our, the uh, PR types, and they're saying, well, Maybe we ought to drop the case that the Supreme Court doesn't to sustain and so forth. And I said, hell no. I mean, you can't do that. Uh, you can't be in a position of having, uh, as I said this morning, we can't be in a position of, uh, of, of ever uh, allowing, it just because some guy's going to be a martyr, uh, of allowing the fellow to get away with this kind of wholesale thievery, or otherwise it's going to happen all over the government. One of the reasons that the Supreme Court ended up ruling that the Times and the Washington Post could publish the Pentagon Papers was because it was a history of the Vietnam War. It was not directly relevant to ongoing military operations. When the Nixon administration tried to use the Espionage Act both to go against Ellsberg for leaking the information and also tried to use the Espionage Act to convince judges to prevent the Times and the Post from publishing the Pentagon Papers, which itself was a very strange use of the Act, because the Espionage Act doesn't have a provision to prevent newspapers from publishing information. You can only go after them after they published it criminally, but it's not a civil law that allows for a prior restraint. So it was strange that they brought that case against the Post and the Times, and of course, the Supreme Court ruled that you cannot exercise a prior restraint on newspapers, that the Post and the Times could publish the Pentagon Papers. The Supreme Court technically did not rule on whether or not the publishers of the Post and the Times could be criminally prosecuted for publishing the Pentagon Papers, and those charges were never brought, though there were at least some grand juries that considered them. Charges were brought against Ellsberg because he was the leaker and he violated his oath of secrecy by leaking those documents. But he didn't end up being convicted in part because 
the Nixon administration tried to prosecute the case in a way that was transparently corrupt by bribing the judge and by breaking into Ellsberg's psychiatrist's office, at which point a mistrial was declared and the charges were dismissed. But that was really one of the first cases where you see charges being brought against a government employee or contractor who had given information to the press and them being accused of espionage and charged under the Espionage Act. The time has come for America to hear the truth about this tragic war. I've chosen to preach about the war in Vietnam today because I agree with Dante that the hottest places in hell are reserved for those who in a period of moral crisis maintain their neutrality. There comes a time when silence is betrayal. If you could sum it up in, in uh, one big round sentence, uh, how does it all come out? It comes out that a, a presidential prosecution that was started for political reasons is ending for political reasons. It was conducted by illegal means from beginning to end. It started, we now know, in order to help re-elect a president, and it's ending now, I think, to avoid impeaching that same president. But it won't stop that process because the facts, thanks in part to this trial, I'm glad to say, are out on the table. They're out of the safes, just as the Pentagon Papers are out of the safes, and they're the same kind of facts. And they can't be put back in the safes. Congress is going to have to deal with them. The courts, the jury, the press, the public, they're all ready. Congress has lagged on this, but they're now ready at last. And they should end the war and end this kind of administrative executive misconduct. Shout to my journalists, it was the way that we earn the chips. Making a living through checks and balances. Huh. Peep what the merger is. Huh. Uh. Don't shoot the messenger. Nah. We just the ones that are serving it. While arms of government lie in vain. What we provided with tourniquets. Uh. Percolate in the tweets. While fire hit the streets. I know what your kryptonite is. Blood is WikiLeaks. Uh. Run up the cables. All of us really no fables. They stress at the oval table. More on the way, man. This is the prelude. Uh. Word to Julian. The darker the info, the juicy. Uh -huh. Official whistleblowers proof of uh -huh. Uh -huh. The government moving like hooligans True. Exposing it, that's what I do to is Stopping the power, abusing it This is what democracy truly is, man This is what democracy truly is Big brother's watching me Opening my diary Big brother's watching me And not can feel his eyes on me Big brother's watching me Knocking me and locking me Told you I'm a spy Just so he could spy on me The majority of the first hundred years of the Espionage Act The government did not seek to prosecute people who leaked classified information to the press specifically. So I believe there were three people who were prosecuted under the Espionage Act under the George W. Bush administration, and Obama nearly tripled that number. Obama prosecuted, I think, eight individuals in total under the Espionage Act for leaking what was, for the most part, information of incredible public significance to the press. On Monday, former CIA officer Jeffrey Sterling was sentenced to 42 months in prison for leaking classified information to New York Times reporter James Rise. The U.S. government is bringing criminal charges, including charges of espionage, against Edward Snowden. Inside the super-secret NSA, several analysts and managers believe that the agency had a powerful tool that might have had a chance to head off 9-11, but it wasn't you. One of those agency insiders was Thomas Drake. Drake tried to get the word out, but now, as a result, he's been charged under the Espionage Act and could spend the rest of his life in prison. And the Trump administration has continued suit and seems on course to exceed the number of prosecutions that the Obama administration brought against press leakers under the Espionage Act. In the first six months of this administration, the Department of Justice has already received nearly as many criminal referrals involving unauthorized disclosures of classified information as we received in the previous three years combined. We are taking a stand. This culture of leaking must stop. Reality Lee Winner, an Air Force veteran who worked as a government contractor is accused of removing classified material from a government facility and mailing it to a news outlet. 
Civil liberties groups were rightfully concerned, and their concerns have played out in the current administration. They cautioned that prosecution of individuals who leaked information to the press, as the Obama administration had started to do, would basically create an even greater culture of secrecy than the government had already instituted up until that point and create widespread chilling effects, both for individuals within government who would want to share important information with the press and with members of the press themselves, who could also fear prosecution under the Espionage Act. And with the indictment of Julian Assange, we have seen those fears actually bear out under this current administration. Seven weeks ago, when Julian Assange of WikiLeaks was dragged out of that embassy in London, headed for possible extradition to the United States, the site's editor, Christian Hrabson, told us the legal charges waiting for him in the U.S. were just the tip of the iceberg, that there would be more coming. And last week, he was proven correct. U.S. prosecutors have expanded the indictment against Assange by another 17 counts. His maximum jail term has jumped from five years to 175 years. And the U.S. Department of Justice is going after him under a different law now, the Espionage Act. That law has been used against whistleblowers before, WikiLeaks source Chelsea Manning included, but never against a publisher. The alarm bells, including from mainstream media organizations that fear the precedent such a prosecution would set, have been going off ever since. The Assange case isn't really about him or WikiLeaks anymore. It has implications, serious ones, for journalists just about everywhere. Former Army intelligence analyst Chelsea Manning was sent to jail Friday for refusing to answer questions in front of a grand jury. Manning was behind one of the biggest leaks of classified documents in U.S. history. CBS News Chief Justice and Homeland Security Correspondent Jeff Begay's has the latest. Manning is being held in a Virginia jail tonight after refusing to testify before a grand jury investigating WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange. What Chelsea Manning disclosed to WikiLeaks included evidence of war crimes committed by the U.S. government. Light them all up. Come on, fire. video footage of the Apache helicopter shootings in Iraq really fueled public debate over American presence in Iraq and what our military was doing on our behalf there. And so I think it's hard to argue that those disclosures were not of public concern. And the First Amendment historically protects information, the publication of information on matters of public concern for very good reason. It's those publications that enable the public to hold the government to account. Without information about what the government is doing on our behalf abroad, we would have no way of ushering in new elected officials who would change policy in a way that we collectively think is in our best interest. WikiLeaks walks like a hostile intelligence service and talks like a hostile intelligence service. It has encouraged its followers to find jobs at the CIA in order to obtain intelligence. It directed Chelsea Manning in her theft of specific secret information. It overwhelmingly focuses on the United States while seeking support from anti-democratic countries and organizations. It's time to call out WikiLeaks for what it really is, a non-state hostile intelligence service often abetted by state actors like Russia. What is different about especially the Assange indictment is that this is the first time you see someone being charged under the Espionage Act for publishing and receiving information as opposed to giving information to a journalist. Manning was charged with leaking information about the secret Afghan war logs and Iraq war logs and the State Department cables to WikiLeaks. And that was a relatively traditional Espionage Act prosecution in the mold of the Obama administration in the sense that she was the leaker. What's very new and frightening about the Assange indictment is that now you have someone who is being indicted under the Espionage Act for receiving and publishing that information. And that, of course, is something that national security journalists do all the time. 
These charges that have been levied against Julian Assange could be extended to any number of journalists who work for more established news organizations. There's no real distinction that the government can point to, although they've tried to cast aspersions on Julian Assange as an individual and in certain instances point to the disclosure of human source information, but in large part have ignored that the indictment focuses on the broader disclosures that Chelsea Manning made to WikiLeaks. There are a number of things that we have learned through leaks to the press, leaks of classified information that the government wants to hold secret. We've learned about prisoner abuse at Abu Ghraib and at Guantanamo. We've learned about drone strikes against not only enemy combatants, but also civilians. We've learned about widespread surveillance of Americans under an NSA program, thanks to Edward Snowden. And we've then engaged in robust public debate about whether or not these policies are appropriate for the government to continue pursuing. Without that information, we can't really call ourselves a democracy with an accountable government. So I think the Espionage Act is being used to protect government secrets to the detriment of our ultimate democratic ambitions. This is a cold game. Word. I feel like we snowed in. Uh. Manning ran all the bulls that touched down around the globe, then got locked up and closed in. Redacted and frozen. Old files of cold winds. So chilling when they blow in. Tapping our phones. Uh. V and I'm burning our homes. The Pentagon papers of Pentagram revealing the demons below. Women and children disposed. Innocent killing with drones. Filthy grunts on the mold. There's so much more hidden for show. Big brother's watching me. Opening my diary. Big brother's watching me and I can feel his eyes on me. Big brother's watching me, knocking me and locking me. He told you I'm a spy just so he could spy on me. Big brother's watching me, opening my diary. Big brother's watching me and I can feel his eyes on me. Big brother's watching me, knocking me and locking me. He told you I'm a spy just so he could spy on me.